Hello, and welcome to part one of a two-part series of presentations entitled Working with Mesh Geometry. In these presentations, we'll explore functionality in SOLIDWORKS 2022 related to working with mesh geometry. In this first part, we will look at tools within SOLIDWORKS for working with graphics bodies. To introduce myself, my name is Marlon Banta. I'm a director in the SOLIDWORKS product definition team. I've been with SOLIDWORKS for, for quite some time. I, I joined the company in April of 2003, and I work out of the head office in Waltham, Massachusetts. It is important to understand what we mean when we say mesh model. When referring to a mesh model, we're referring to a model um, whose boundary representation is defined by a bunch of mesh facets, and in this case, a bunch of triangular facets. On the slide, you can see many synonyms for a mesh model. They're sometimes called tessellated geometry, a mesh model, mesh file, facet geometry, discretized model, triangular mesh model. I've also heard polygonal model used, um, even though in this case, the polygons are, are simple triangles. But in essence, this is a, a, a geometric shape that's been broken down into these little pieces or these facets. And this is very different from regular SOLIDWORKS geometry where every point on the boundary representation of the surface of a model is known by an equation um, that's accurate to 10 to the minus eight meters. When we are talking about mesh models in this presentation, it's also important to note that we are not talking about simulation mesh models or quad mesh models. So the two images on the right are a simulation mesh and a simulation mesh is 3D geometry that has been discretized using small three-dimensional units, in this case, tetrahedrons. And in that situation, the inside, the geometry inside the volume of the model is also discretized and also analyzed in the simulation. On the left, we have a, a quad mesh, and this is a mesh generated in X shape. And the meshes that we are referring to are purely triangular meshes. To give a little background on mesh files, I've included this image in the slide as an analogy to a mesh file in that a mesh file represents complex geometry using small flat planar triangles. I know we have planar squares in this, tiles in this image, but you can imagine that you have complex geometry that we're representing with the mesh file, and instead of smooth geometry, we've discretized it or broke it down into small planar units that can, from a distance, trick the eye into making you think it's a smooth surface, but it's really a bunch of small planar tiles. Again, triangular shaped tiles. The data inside a mesh file, you know, something like an STL file, an OBJ file, or a 3MF file, is generally rather, rather simple. You have information related to the normals of the facets, and the normals help you understand what is the internal volume of the facet versus an externally facing side of each of these facets or these little triangular planar elements. And then you have information about the three vertices that represent the edges, or the, I'm sorry, the vertex, vertexes at, on the corners of the triangles. So here we see vertex one, vertex two, vertex three, and that information repeats for every facet in the model. And with this in mind, it's easy to see how the file size of a mesh file is proportional to the number of facets and also proportional to however many digits are used to define the X, Y, and Z location of each vertex. Lastly, I'll point your attention to a Microsoft 3D Viewer application that allows you to preview mesh files. We'll demonstrate that later uh, in, in the presentation. So where do these mesh files come from? How do, we, how do we get mesh files that we bring into SOLIDWORKS? One source of mesh data is the output from 3D scanners. 3D scanners are becoming more and more ubiquitous in the industry as the prices decrease and the quality of the scans increase. You have optical scanners and also contact scanners. These scanners produce a point cloud and then the software that usually comes with the scanner joins these points into a triangular mesh file so that you essentially represent the exterior boundary of the object or room or whatever it is that you scanned with a 3D scanner. 
Mesh files are also the output of artistic mesh-based modeling software, products like ZBrush, Mudbox, Cinema 4D, Modo. There's also a lot of sub-D modeling uh, software products. And generally, they use a discretized mesh model because they're creating very complex geometry, you know, very organic shapes. You can imagine a, a cartoon character with, with hair and wings and horns and something like that very complex shapes that would be difficult to capture using traditional CAD geometry. Of course, mesh files are also a CAD file that has been exported to a file format like STL or OBJ or now a 3MF. In, in this situation, when somebody sends you a CAD file as a mesh file, they for some reason have intended to degrade the file significantly. Exports such as Parasolid Export or IGIS Step, these are much better suited for for a CAD export. Certainly the output of a simulation study can be a mesh file that can be used for modeling. We have the deformed geometry functionality or the export deformed geometry functionality in SOLIDWORKS simulation. And the output of a topology simulation study is also a mesh file that you use as a guide for creating a, a new part, or you can actually work directly now in SOLIDWORKS with the mesh file to create the final geometry informed by the topology study. This is the result of a survey that we ran looking at the most common file formats for mesh files imported into SOLIDWORKS. And by far, STL is the most common file format, then OBJ, and there's a few other file formats. I would point your attention to 3MF. 3MF is a new file format. Dassault Systems is a member of the consortium that is developing the 3MF file format. And the 3MF file format is intended to be a neutral file format that contains all of the information required to 3D print your CAD geometry. Things like material assignments, the color of the of the model, the structure of the of the assemblies, and of course the geometry represented using a triangular mesh file. So one common question, of course, is what do you do with mesh files once you've brought them into SOLIDWORKS? One thing you can do is use the mesh file as a visual reference. So you can add context behind a model. In this example, I have downloaded a coconut tree from TurboSquid. TurboSquid is an online repository, one of many online repositories of files that can be used in rendering and animation, not necessarily used for engineering, but more for rendering and animation. So I've downloaded this coconut tree imported into SOLIDWORKS, and I can show my SOLIDWORKS model next to a coconut tree, so using the mesh file as a visual reference. Another use is to use the mesh file as a geometric reference. On the left, I have a mesh file of a smartphone, and you can see how I use that as a geometric reference to create a smartphone case that you can see surrounding the smartphone in the image on the right. We'll get into an example, a more in-depth example of this later on in this presentation. Of course, when thinking of mesh files and the output from a 3D scanner, reverse engineering comes to mind. Within SOLIDWORKS, we do have some tools related to reverse engineering, but in this example, I'm actually showing a workflow, a reverse engineering workflow that is used in the reverse engineer role provided by CATIA. You can see it on the 3D Experience uh, platform. These are the steps that you would follow in the digitized shape preparation and the digitized shape to surface applications that are part of the reverse engineer role. Another use for mesh files is to create geometry that is only possible with mesh. On the left, we see the head of a snake. That would be very complex geometry to create in SOLIDWORKS using classic BREP geometry, but quite a bit easier to create using mesh geometry. On the right, we see a product called Mesh Mixer, which is a free mesh preparation software tool. And there I'm using the uh, the pull functionality to, to pull, I guess, these finger-like structures away from the model of the rabbit. Uh, an interesting thing is in, in rendering, the most common model that you see in rendering is that teapot. And it seems to be that in working with mesh files, this bunny rabbit is quite popular. And then another use is what we call continuing engineering. And so in this example, we started out with a mesh file of Batman, you know, we've imported an STL file, and we've added SOLIDWORKS geometry 
to that mesh file to make it into a manufacturable and, and also a usable toy. So this is very common in the toy industry to, to have the figure drawn in artistic mesh modeling software, and then an engineer would make it a manufacturable product in SolidWorks. And this is actually the, the bulk of the content that we'll present in part two of the Working with Mesh Geometry presentation series. Other uses for mesh files, we of course talked about when you export a mesh file and if you um, export a SOLIDWORKS file or any CAD geometry to a mesh file, you know, you can use it as a neutral file export, but again, it, it, it is a, a much lower quality export than other formats such as uh, STEP or IGIS or of course for SOLIDWORKS, Parasolid. And then as we all know, mesh files are what is used in, in, in additive manufacturing. We start with a mesh file, we slice the model and we get a series, you know, essentially a polyline or a series of lines that are used to write the g-code to drive the 3d printer before we jump into solidworks i would like to review some of the terms that we'll use throughout the rest of this presentation first let's talk about the three main body types in solidworks the first main body type is classic b-rep bodies and this is solidworks geometry that you've been creating in SOLIDWORKS for many years. When you extrude, when you add a fillet, cut a hole, that is classic BRAP geometry. When you import a mesh file directly into SOLIDWORKS, it creates a graphics body. You are somewhat limited in what you can do with graphics bodies, but we have made significant improvements starting in SOLIDWORKS 2018. Next is mesh BRAP bodies, and this is sort of a hybrid between classic BRAP and graphics bodies. A mesh BRAP body, the boundary representation of the geometry, is determined using a series of triangles, or or mesh body, but we wrap a surface around it, and there are many geometry, geometric operations that you can perform on uh, mesh BRAP bodies, and many SOLIDWORKS features are supported for mesh BRAP bodies. So here we have an example of a classic BRAP body. You know, you can see the feature tree and all the features that you've used to create the classic BRAP body. A graphics body is represented as a faceted model, and the edges of the facets are black in a graphics body, which is different from a mesh BREP body where we color the edges of the facets gray. And so that's one way that you can tell the difference between a graphics body and a mesh BREP body. We'll get into mesh BREP bodies a lot more in part two. And we will also get into exciting new functionality in SOLIDWORKS 2022, which is a hybrid body. And a hybrid body is a combination of classic BREP features added or subtracted from a mesh BREP body. And this supports a workflow that we refer to as continuing engineering. When we're talking about facets and mesh geometry, the term facet refers to the individual triangles that we use to discretize the model. That triangle is bounded by three facet fins or edges and the corners of that triangle those are facet vertexes and those are some common terms that we'll use throughout the rest of the presentation so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the functionality in solidworks related to mesh models to do this we'll launch the 3d experience platform and within the platform click on the compass come here to 3d experience solidworks premium and we'll go ahead and launch solidworks so solidworks 3d experience connected launched We'll go to the open dialog. Here we have some of the, the mesh models. These are STL files that we'll use in this presentation. I would like to show you with the open dialog open that you can right click and launch 3D viewer. We don't show a preview of the STL files in the file open dialog, but you can see a preview without opening the file using the Microsoft 3D viewer. The Microsoft 3D viewer is a free tool that you can get from the Microsoft store. And this is a tool that allows you to preview mesh files. So we'll go ahead and we're gonna open this STL file. Before we do that, let's look at some of the options that you have available to you. I always like to open models as graphics bodies first, then I can clean them up and then maybe uh, convert them to mesh BREP later. Um, we have had options to open the, the model as a solid body or as a surface body. These options are of limited value because what it does is it basically converts every facet into a, a face. So you have, you have a, a model with a whole bunch of faces, you know, one for every facet. For models with fewer facets, there, there may be value. Certainly, if you choose the option to open it as a solid body, you do have these options here, which allow you to open it as a mesh BREP body. But we're going to go back to graphics body. One thing that I'd also warn you about is to pay attention to units. 
you can if you you know set it to meters and let's say the the model was originally like 2000 millimeters across but you set the units to meters then you'll run into a problem with hitting the the one kilometer limit within your model so do pay attention to units so we'll open this in millimeters so here we have a mesh file and we can see that we have a high facet count for the part of the model truly wanted in the scan we have a lot of extraneous geometry in the scan, and this is commonly scanner noise. The first time I scanned a model, my thumb got captured in the, in the 3D scan. So what we want to do is we want to clean up this model so that we can work with it as we intend in SolidWorks. So one thing you could do is come here and pick one of these extraneous bodies and just hit delete. So there we've removed some of that that uh, excess uh, geometry. We also have these filters here for the selection of mesh facets, the selection of mesh edges or mesh fins, and the selection of mesh vertices. I'd also want to point your attention to uh, this graphics body folder. So when there are graphics bodies in the model, you will see them listed here in the graphics body folder. So another thing you could simply do is we'll set the filter mesh facets and you can go and pick individual facets, you know, holding down the control key and hit delete. So there we've deleted those facets. That is of some value. Another thing you could do with this filter on is come here and we're going to paint select. And so basically all facets that are under this paintbrush as I'm running it across get selected. I create a facet group and I can just go ahead and hit delete. Now we seem to have missed a few here, but we can, you know, clean those up with individual facet selection or we can run paint select again. Another tool that we have is I can come in here and turn on tangent select. And so basically any facet within 15 degrees of that of the selected facet will be included in the facet group. You know, and clearly if I go and lower this angle, there are some facets that won't be selected. There's a certain point, probably around 15 degrees, maybe a little bit more, where we'll capture every facet in this facet group. So if I hit OK and then press Delete, you know, you can see that we've deleted all those, or most of those facets, and what really happened is it added a bunch of additional facet bodies because we didn't pick all of them. So of course I can come in here and also just delete all of those bodies. So now we're left with this hat uh, on this base. After removing the excess bodies, we see that we're left with a closed graphics body that can be converted into a mesh beer up solid. But in this example, let's say that I want to cut away the base. So one way that I could do that is I'll create a reference plane and I'm going to turn on this facet vertice filter and I'm going to create a reference plane through three points. So I'm just kind of randomly picking points or not so randomly picking points on the model to generate that reference plane. And I can come in here, insert cut with surface. I'm going to flip the direction and I can use cut with surface to create a clean cut at the bottom of that helmet and remove that base. There's one more thing that I would like to point out with this example before we move on. If you'll notice, we've deleted several bodies, we've made a surface cut, and nothing has been added to the feature manager tree. In the previous example, when I did the cut with surface, message appears that says that note the changes in graphics bodies cannot be edited and a feature will not be added to the feature manager tree. So when we're working with mesh geometry, we don't, you know, unlike classic BRAP bodies or mesh BRAP bodies, we don't store features in the feature manager tree and all of these edits happen to the mesh. The one thing that you can do, of course, is you can hit uh, control Z to um, undo an operation. Before we move on, I'll give you a few moments 
to review the features, functions, and topics that we discussed in that first example. If you were to export a cube from SOLIDWORKS to a mesh file, the result would be this. You would have essentially 12 facets, so two triangles per face representing the model, and that's a very small file. However, if you were to scan a cube, it would look more like this, because the way that scanners work, they fire many points to try and capture the geometry of the part or model that the scanner is scanning. This generally results in files that are much larger than what would absolutely be needed to represent the geometry. If you look, the 12 facet cube is only one kilobyte, and here we have the scan cube at 564 kilobytes. And if you'll remember, previously I stated that performance within SOLIDWORKS is directly proportional to the number of facets. And so this brings us to our next topic, and that is using decimation to reduce the number of facets while maintaining the desired shape and topology of the mesh file. To look at decimation, let's go back to our hard hat model. Okay, before we begin, let me point out a few other user interface items. We do have a command manager that contains a lot of functions specific to mesh, and then also SOLIDWORKS features that work with mesh BRAP bodies. Again, we'll get into that more in part two. We also, of course, have the mesh menu here in the uh, insert menu. So what we're going to do is run decimate mesh body. For decimate mesh body, you can select an entire graphics body or you have options for paint select and tangent select. And essentially what you do in decimate is it tells you how many facets there are and you indicate what percentage reduction you would like or if somehow you know an absolute reduction amount, you can enter that there. And then this is the maximum deviation tolerance. And so that is how far the facet can deviate from after decimation from the original mesh. So here I'm going to enter 70 and I'll just press calculate. And we can see now that we have a graphics body with 70% less facets. So it went from about 27,000 to just around 8,000 facets. That represents, well represents the desired topology and geometry. Of course, you can reduce the facet count too low such that it becomes you know, more faceted or, or less smooth. But with decimation, you can reach a point where you reduce the facet count while maintaining the desired topology and geometry. Before we move on, here are the features and functions that we reviewed in this last example. Now let's look at some of the ways that we can use mesh geometry once we've brought it into SOLIDWORKS. In this example, let's consider in this scenario that I am designing a couch. I've downloaded this couch off of 3D Content Central, and I would like to show this couch in a room or in an appropriate context. So I want to put other objects around that couch to you know, make it seem as though it's, it's in a, a room. One thing I can do is to go on to sites such as TurboSquid or, or Thingiverse or you know, any number of websites that contain mesh models and models that are used for rendering and, and animation. And in this example, I've found this, this plant and it's a, a free download off of TurboSquid. So I've downloaded it and imported it into SOLIDWORKS. So here is that mesh file. What I'd like to do next is add appearances to this model to make it, you know, so it's not just a flat gray model. I can come in here and let's say that for the plants, I'm going to apply a, a grass appearance. For the legs, we will have so chromium plate, let's add that to the other leg as well. And let's say that for the legs, we're going to add, I don't know, maybe polished mahogany. I'm sorry, not the legs, but the, the table itself. 
So there we have appearances applied to this table. And you can imagine creating an assembly where we have our model next to the mesh that I imported, in this case from TurboSquid. So if I turn on perspective, I can go into Photo View 360, launch the preview window, and you can see how we are using this mesh file as a visual reference, you know, as a model to give context to the couch within that room. One thing to note is that this is not uh, SOLIDWORKS 3D Experience Connected. This is the desktop version of SOLIDWORKS. In SOLIDWORKS 3D Experience Connected, the rendering tool that is available to SOLIDWORKS 3D Experience Connected users is SOLIDWORKS Visualize Professional. Here I'm using PhotoView 360. Before we move on to the next example, here are the features and functions that we just reviewed. Now let's look at how we can use a graphics body, an imported mesh, as a geometric reference. Let's say in this example, I have a smartphone. It's been scanned in. There's It's kind of a noisy scan. You know, there's a, a lot of facets missing. But what I want to do is recreate the, the smartphone as, as SOLIDWORKS geometry so that I can build a smartphone case. If you remember an earlier example in the presentation, I had a smartphone and, and building a case. The first thing I'd want to do is take a few measurements of the phone to try and understand you know, the sizes that I'm working with. So to do this, we'll go to the measure dialog and I'll enable for this first measurement, the filter for facet vertices. And what I want to do is understand the radius of this, this bend here. So come here and I'll pick that point and then come here and pick that point. And we can see that it's a 10 millimeter radius. Okay, great. So then let's also try and understand the thickness of this phone. I'll pick a facet here on the top and a facet there on the bottom. And we see that the normal distance between the two is 7.1 millimeters. So I've got a few measurements to help guide my design. Now that we've done a few measurements, Let's add some geometric references to this model to help guide our design. What I'd like to do is turn on the mesh ver vertex filter, and I'm going to add a 3D sketch. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop 3D sketch points as strategic locations within the mesh to help guide my design. So here I'm putting one in the corners, one on that side of the thickness, Put another one on this side. And maybe I'll go to the opposite corner. And now what I have are 3D sketch points that I can use to try and recreate this geometry. So if I hide the graphics body, there are my points. And let's say that I'm going to sketch here. Oh, I'm going to sketch here, go normal. I'm going to create a corner rectangle. Let me shut off that filter. Add a few relations, we're going to go coincident. Okay. And if I, I can extrude that, up to that point. So if I turn that back on, you can see that I've created a solid rectangle that encloses the entire iPhone. Now, because we took that measurement, we know that we need 10 millimeter radiuses on the corners, 
and we can add a full face fillet. around that edge all the way around. And you can see that very quickly we've created a classic B-Rep body that very closely matches the graphics body that we imported. And from here I can further refine the geometry to include let's say these volume buttons and some of these other features and either I've I can work in a reverse engineering workflow or I can build on top of the geometry that I created using the mesh as a geometric reference. Before we move on to the next example, here are the features and functions that we just reviewed. So let's look at some more reverse engineering type tools that we have in SOLIDWORKS when it comes to working with mesh files. Here we have three rather well-behaved mesh bodies. Clearly I exported a cube, a sphere, and a cylinder. Before we get into the reverse engineering, I'd like to show that we can, you know, you can create a section of mesh bodies. The one thing is that it has to be a graphics only section. If you, you get a warning message that you need it to be a graphics only section, in order to show the section view. You can also, with mesh files, there are features here, like you can you know, maybe move that body to be closer to that other one. So looking at the mesh modeling command manager, we have surface from mesh. If I click on that, in surface from mesh, we first are required to identify what kind of surface we think it is or what we're, we're trying to recreate. So in this case, we're going to say these are planar surfaces. And if I go and select a facet, I can define an offset to that facet. And if I hit calculate, you can see we, that we've created a surface that extends beyond the, the selected facets. So we essentially create a planar surface. Let's see if I hide, hide the mesh, that's my planar surface. And so in this workflow, you can imagine creating a series of these planar surfaces. And with that series of planar surfaces, I, I'm allowing them to extend beyond that surface a little bit. We can get, you know, essentially a box made out of those surfaces that we can come in here and trim together. And if I say, uh, oh, no, I want to keep I keep that, 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 and create a solid. And there we have, we've essentially reverse engineered that cube to reproduce a solid cube. There's the mesh sort of coincident with that cube. And of course, in surface from mesh, We have options for spheres. When I'm doing a complete sphere, you can't really have an extension. Um, and so we can create a sphere and we can also, you know, recognize cylinders here. I'll add an extension to that cylinder. And there we've essentially reversed engineered that cube, the cylinder, and the sphere. So these were, as you saw, very well-behaved geometries. Clearly that was from a CAD export. But if we're looking at, at other mesh files, you know, this is, this is the result of scanning a, uh, a spray bottle. If we're looking at other mesh files, of course, they're not always so well-behaved. Here we can see a little bit of uh, scanner error. 
you know, these, these sort of dimples and features in the mesh. And if we wanted to recreate this face as a plane, we'd have to use some of the other controls that were available. The first thing that I would recommend is, you know, we can do either paint select or tangent select. Here I would pick tangent select, and you can see that we're going over, you know, we're wrapping all the way around, and that's not really what we want. You know, we just want to reproduce this one planar face. So let me drop the tolerance down. There we go, to about one degree, and that, that captures a good number of facets that we can average together to create the planar face. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Um, we'll have uh, just a small offset, and if I calculate, probably at this facet tolerance, I'll get an error. Let's set that to zero. Oh, it seemed to be able to recreate that face at that at that setting. And so if I hide that, you see that we get a planar face that is a faithful representation of that front face of the bottle. And of course, we can come in here and get rid of these using the delete hole command. There we go. We need to do that here. And so here I have planar, you know, classic BREP geometry created from the original mesh. And these are tools that you can use to reverse engineer a, a mesh file. Here are the features and functions that we looked at in this last section. When you've created classic BREP geometry based on mesh geometry, you often want to try and understand how closely the geometry you created matches the original mesh. To answer this question, we have the body compare function. First, you select the source body, which in this case would be the mesh body, and then, then you select the compare body, so the, the body that you created. Here we see that we've matched the mesh one-to-one -one on the color chart. You know, there's zero deviation. We can increase the sensitivity a little bit, um, but I think that that will remain the case. You do have the option to show the legend on screen. And if we hit OK, we see that that display is persistent. And of course, we can turn it off here. If we take a look at the spray bottle, we should see quite a bit more deviation. We can, we can notice it in the geometry here. So if I go to body compare, I'll select that as the source body. I'm gonna want to hide the source body and that will be my compare body. We can increase the sensitivity and we can see from the color chart that we have deviations as much as 1.4 millimeters. These colors represent deviations in the opposite direction relative to the mesh, and it can go as far in as 1.4 millimeters. And so it gives us a good sense as to how closely the geometry that we created matches the original mesh. Here's the functionality that we reviewed in this last section. This concludes part one of working with mesh geometry. Thank you very much for watching. And I would strongly encourage you to please check out part two, especially where we will review the hybrid mesh functionality that is new in SOLIDWORKS 2022. Before we go, I did want to give credit to some of the people that provided some of the models in this presentation. Um, I downloaded the Batman model provided by Skip Montanola um, off of Thingiverse, Indony Design, provided the, the palm tree model on TurboSquid as a free download. SpaceScan provided this plant on a table as a free download on TurboSquid. And the couch I downloaded off of 3D Content Central, and that model was provided by Sean Klein. Again, thank you for watching my presentation, and please check out part two of Working with Mesh Geometry.